Shalom. We are back talking about the colors of the rainbow. And when we define these, looking for the names of the colors in Tanakh, we really only found five colors. When Newton defined the colors originally, he only defined five colors. Uh, it was red, yellow, green, blue, and what he called violet. He later added orange and indigo because he thought it would be more aesthetic for the number of colors to match the number of notes in a diatonic scale. However, there is a pentatonic scale and it's used widely around the world. It only has five notes. And so we have defined these five colors for the rainbow. Before we go on to the actual covenants, I thought it'd be interesting to see how these five colors line up with the five books of Moses. The association between the color red and Genesis is pretty clear in several places. We know that Adam, the first man, came from the land, the Adama, and inside both of those words is the blood, it's the Dom. And so all these ideas are related, and of course, blood, when it's exposed to air, is red. We see mention of the blood in some of the covenants. One of the laws that Yahweh gave to Noah coming off the boat after establishing it is in Genesis 9:6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God he made man. In uh, Genesis 17, it talks about the covenant, the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham, the blood of the circumcision. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and the seed and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. We see the blood involved in Joseph's trial in Genesis 37, 22. And Reuben said unto them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, and lay no hand upon him, that he might rid him out of their hands, to deliver him to his father again. So Reuben was trying to save Joseph's life, and so he intervened that he, they wouldn't kill him, the brothers wouldn't kill him. But in the meantime, they sold him off to Egypt. And in Genesis 37, 31, the brothers took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the goats and dipped the coat in the blood. We also looked at the other word besides Adom, the Adam color, uh, red, and that was of the Tola'acheni, the worm whose blood um, is used for red dye. And all this reminds us uh, that we are redeemed by the blood of Yeshua. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Messiah, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And again in Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So even from the very foundation, that precious blood was shed on our behalf. So all this idea of redness is found in the book of Genesis from the begin very beginning of everything. The association of uh, gold with Exodus should be pretty obvious as they are making the tabernacle, all these things are called to be made out of gold. The ark, the atonement cover, the mercy seat and its cherubim, 
the showbread table, which literally showbread means bread of the face and all the things that go with it, the menorah and all the things that go with it, the clasps that hold the curtains up on the outside. All the boards are covered with gold. The pillars are covered with gold. The ephod is uh, made out, of, has gold woven into it, gold string, gold thread. The breastplate, the bells around the uh, hem of the priest's garment, the little crown, the plate that says uh, Kadosh la Yahweh, to, uh, holy to God. Um, that plate is made out of gold and also the altar of incense. So some of these things are solid gold like the menorah and some of them are gold plated. Oh, and then there was that other thing that they made out of gold in the midst of the desert there. Uh, this picture is from the carnival in Rio from 2010. One of the floats, the group decided that they would do a multicultural set of floats. And apparently this is the one that represents Judaism. Nice call. And of course, all the gold came originally from Egypt. Exodus 12.35 And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. So all the gold came out with the Exodus from Egypt. How is Leviticus green? Leviticus is the essence of uh, Torah. It's in the center of Torah. In Proverbs 3.18, it is written, She, which is uh, considered wisdom or Torah, is a tree of life to them that lay hold of her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. When we see the scroll of the Torah, we see that it is held up by trees. Also, the man who uh, busies himself with Torah is compared to a tree. Psalm 1, verse 2 and 3. But his delight is in the Torah of Yahweh, and in his Torah doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So if we busy ourselves in Torah, we will be like a green, growing tree, healthy growing tree. The association of numbers and blue. We saw previously that several of the articles that are in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, when they are being moved, are covered with cloths of blue. Uh, of course, there's a lot of blue inside the tabernacle, and we read about that in Exodus. But imagine the camp. The camp is walking along, and there are these special articles, in fact, four of them, that are covered with blue Numbers is the only place where it talks about actually tzitzit. There's another place in Deuteronomy where they're called by a different name, gedilim, which just means long extensions of some sort, although it's translated as fringe in both places. Numbers 15 is the only place where it talks about the string of blue. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of Yahweh and do them, that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. So this is the only place that it talks about that string of blue that's supposed to be in the tzitzit. Not to belabor the obvious, the Torah never mentions that the sky is blue uh, because the sky is blue all over the world, and we understand that. So if you can hold in your mind, here's the picture of the children of Israel. What are they doing in Numbers? They're walking and walking and walking under this blue sky with these four items that are covered with blue cloths in the midst of the parade of people. 
and uh, and they had the blue string on their Garmin. Maybe you can put all that together for what that means. To understand how Deuteronomy is connected to purple, we're going to go back to the roots, um, Arag and Ragam. And Arag, if you remember, was to cast forth threads for weaving, how you send them back and forth across the loom. Ragam is to cast forth a stone for killing. And so in post-biblical Hebrew, the root for ragam also became to cast forth words for shouting, and that's where we get our word targum. The targum you probably have heard about. There's several of them. Some of them are quite well known. The uh, targum onkelos. Onkelos was a uh, Roman proselyte. Uh, com he converted to Judaism in order to study Torah. And so his Targum is written in Aramaic, and it's probably from the first century. And there's another one, there's a little bit of discussion about whether it should be called the Targum Yerushalayim, or the Targum Yonatan ben Uziel, or the Targum Pseudo Yonatan, because maybe Yonatan didn't really write it, or somebody else did, I don't know. You can look at this uh, website and find translations of both of those texts. Um, it's in the Targums where we study about the concept, for example, of the Memra, um, the Word of God. Now, how did that whole idea, that translation and interpretation idea develop? That is in Tanakh. During the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, we see that the people are standing to listen as Ezra reads the Torah, Nehemiah 8. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. In other words, he was standing on a platform. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen and Amen, with lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. Also Yeshua and Bani, Sherevah, Yamin, Aku, Shevatai, Hodia. Maaseya, Kalita, Azariah, Yezavad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. So in times prior to microphones, this is a large group of people. Ezra is reading. Presumably the Levites are already familiar what is written in Torah, and they are scattered among the people. And so perhaps there are vocabulary that the people have lost because I've already been out of the land for maybe 150 years. And so the Levites can explain to them vocabulary or explain to them concepts that they don't get. And the Levites are standing in the crowd giving this Targum. Now, the entire book of Deuteronomy is Moses's Targum of everything that's happened up to that point. In Deuteronomy 32, 2, he says, My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. The word there for doctrine is lekach, and it comes from the root lakach, which means to take. So it's what he has taken away from schlepping around in the desert with these people uh, for 40 years and finally bringing them to the point where he's going to bring, them. he's not going to bring them into the promised land because he can't go, but they are getting ready to go in the promised land. So he gives his targum of everything that's happened. And just for an example, in Exodus 20, verse 8, talking about the 10 sayings or the Ten Commandments, as they're called, it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But in Deuteronomy, when he gives a repetition, he says, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So I don't know if uh, he heard both things from the Father while he was on the mountain and he's delivering an additional one, or this is part of his interpretation. But it is different than the original text, so we can say, well, it's kind of like a Targum. Next time we will go on to talking about the covenants. 
In the meantime, Tasimata Inayam Ahashamayam, keep your eyes on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom. Whoa.